Good morning. Buenos dias. Chairperson, Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Ambassador Ediko, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur Ediko, Director General, Director General of IOM, Ambassador William Swing, William Swing. Ambassadors, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Fellow Migrants, if there are some here, all protocol observed. Je voudrais saluer tout le monde. I must say that uh, I'm very honored to have been uh, invited to join you on an issue which is part of my own history. I have been a migrant, and uh, the, exper the experiences we talk about are also part of my trajectory of life. So I have a huge empathy for those still who are still migrants. In preparation for this uh, talk this morning, I came across with the uh, thorough, deep, and uh, complete information about migration. I have to thank you and uh, congratulate you for the kind of information which is provided to decision makers, to civil society organizations like us, to citizens in general, to understand the complexity and the different dimensions of uh, what migration means. Of course, this is an issue which today uh, is a hot issue. It divides public opinion. Governments lose rating because of migration. Some even lose elections because of migration. Presidents are wary to take very bold decisions because they do not know whether they are not going to be impinged because of migration. But I want to say that migration is a manifestation of developments, many developments, which happened in recent century, I think 20th, 20th century, and now at the beginning of uh, 21st century. So we should celebrate the fact that people today have uh, much more information. You press a button, and information will be available all over the world. So people are, in terms of information, much, much closer uh, than ever before. Movements are also easy. People do travel by road, train, by plane. It's much easier to cross continents today than it has ever been before. But more importantly is that there's much more freedom of choice. People have much more opportunity to choose where to live, what to do, and because they can move, of course they will go where they feel is the best place for them to realize their aspirations. And this is a trend, in my view, which is going to increase, then decrease. So, as a human family, I think we just have to learn to be comfortable with it and to learn how to manage it in a way we all continue to belong to the same space, which is the space of a family, in which we have a right, whether you were born in Mozambique, like me, or you were born in Iceland, whether you were born in Asia or you were born in Latin America, all of us, we have a space and we need to have a sense of belonging and sharing whatever is available and we feel we are entitled to.
intercambiar porque este espacio nos permite. Migration is happening in many ways, in many directions. From developing countries to developing ones. From developing countries to developing countries. And even, let me talk of my own continent, Africa. We have much more movements of people inside Africa than what is being perceived as people from Africa elsewhere. We do have, I mean, uh, it happens also from developed countries to developing countries, which we do not talk about. What has made people uncomfortable, most probably, it's not, it's not essentially the numbers of people, but I think it's the circumstances in which people feel more. Because as I'm saying, if we were to number Africans moving within the continent, then we would be talking of millions, while from Africa to Europe, we would talk maybe of uh, hundreds of thousands. Let me give another example. There is migration from North Europe to southern Europe because people now they stop working at the age of 55 they are very well professionally they have resources and they decide instead of living in Sweden or in Norway they are going to live in Spain Portugal and uh, because it's much warmer it's much pleasant and they migrate and it's not a problem to anyone. We also have people who are coming to live. Let me give the example of my second country, which is South Africa. We have lots of people who are coming to live in Cape Town because it's a beautiful place and people can own property. They live there and it's not a problem. We even now, because uh, Europe is, uh, e European economies are under strain, we are having movement of people coming to Africa because Africa is now good news. Economic growth is there, opportunities are there. It's not only opportunities of investment, opportunities to work. And we are having thousands and thousands of you just look at planes, thousands of people who are coming to look for opportunities to work in our, can in our, in our country. But this is not news. It's normal, it's fine. What becomes news? It's when people move from Africa to Europe, when people move from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, when people move from Asia to Europe, and when they move, of course, from South America to the U.S., then we have a big problem. And we are all very concerned. Why is it? I think we are growing fearful of diversity. People are not necessarily uncomfortable because they feel threatened directly. They, are, they feel threatened because the difference which is brought by those who have a, a skin color like mine, who have a religion which is different, who have cultural practices which are different, all these make people feel uncomfortable. But it, according to statistics which I got from the migration actually, there are lots of benefits which don't seem to be known to many. Immigrants from developing economies contributed an estimate of 40% of labor force growth in advanced economies between 1980 and 2010. 40%. It's almost half. As for leading global economies, employers reporting difficulties in filling jobs were 12% in the UK, 
21% in France, 24% in China, 40% in Germany and US, and 64% in India. I'm just giving examples. There are opportunities which are not being filled, and looking at migration as an element which can help to make our economies, develop the economies work, it should be a window of opportunity instead of discomfort. Migrants contribute greatly both to countries of origin and they host communities. The diaspora have an important role to play in helping their communities back home. And I'm sure you have heard of these numbers before. Global remittances flows, including those to high-income countries, where an estimate of 529 billion in 2012 alone. Developing countries received about 401 billion in remittances during, again, 2012. So there are flows of resources which are important. Actually, the 400 billion I'm talking about are much more than what is known as uh, aid development. So, are this information known for the majority of, uh, of our people, both in countries of origin and ca receiving countries? Wouldn't be important to make this information available so that we look at migration in its positive aspects, not necessarily in the negative ones, which I'm going also to be talking about. Migration has brought to surface some of the ugliest perceptions and preconceptions among us as human family. Discrimination on the basis of race has become rough. Gender discrimination against the women who migrate and the way they are humiliated and the way they are being treated, even children, discrimination on the basis of uh, class, not only of race and gender, but of class, discrimination on the basis of religion, anything which is different from the other has come to surface, and it has created an environment of discomfort, as I mentioned. I think diversity is a strength, not weakness. We need to learn to live with diversity. Nous devons apprendre à vivre avec and when we are in the beginning of 21st century, having such sophisticated human rights and humanitarian laws, where we talk of equality and the rights to everyone, it sounds a contradiction that those instruments are more and more sophisticated and we talk about them, but our practices are telling us that we are really very uncomfortable with living with diversity, with accepting other people as equal to us. So I think this is a moral dilemma of our times. I think it's a question we have to raise seriously and say, what is it which goes in our minds but in our feelings, there is something completely different. And we go to the point, actually, of people dying. And when they die, the reaction 
If it's this or those, it's completely different. So it's not only discrimination. It's even the value of a human life, which is different when we are talking in some circumstances or when we are talking in other circumstances. So I want to raise this, of course, as I said at the beginning, there are economic benefits of this. They are technological benefits of this. They are labor advantages of this. But at the same time, there is a huge moral issue which we have to address. The Declaration of Human Rights, which is the flag of any of our international uh, the standards, I think it has to be recalled here and to be reminded to all of us. It's not a question only which was relevant in circumstances it was adopted. Maybe today we have to re-adopt it and discuss it even more. This is important because we are going to be discussing, I think, in the panel, the, the post-2015 agenda in which we are going to say of the major shifts, the first one and the most important is leave no one behind. And these are not only words. It means we need to re-engineer our thinking, our institutions, our way of uh, organizing the economies of the world in a way we are not going to leave anyone behind. In a period of 15 years. How this is going to happen? It cannot be business as usual. I want, therefore, to submit to this in the context of migration a few things. I think governments, both north and south, have to revisit the way they present themselves in terms of uh, migration to their constituencies. I think there is clearly, and you know I'm an activist, so I'll talk in my language. I think there is a lack of courage to adopt what we know is right. Instead of uh, making of migration an issue of winning or losing elections, it's a question of saying what is the obligations of all of us in sharing, in sharing resources, in sharing space, in sharing knowledge, building on diversity as a strength instead of fearing diversity. You have to go out and explain this to your own people. And constituencies will understand, particularly when we present the numbers. So instead of playing with human life between elections and not elections, I think the courage of leadership and to do the right thing and to explain the right thing because we only have to benefit and we know we benefit much more than we can think we lose. I know there's a huge responsibility from uh, countries of origin of migrants. Yes, of course. Some cases it's because of conflict. Other cases it's because of disasters. Other, other cases it's political instability. It is important that we fix our homes as well. We create opportunities where everyone will feel comfortable to stay home and to meet his own, his or her aspirations at home. And yes, then the difference, it's not that we are not going to have migration. But the quality of migration we are going to have, it will be different. So it will be a question of quality. 
Governments, both sides, I think they need to do much more and with much more sense of responsibility. And in my view, I think we cannot get used to, to the spectacle of what, what, what is happening in the Mediterranean. We cannot get used to that. It's unacceptable that in the middle of what is possible to do, it's almost every day we'll see people dying or being moved as commodities. I know there is crime involved in smuggles. Those who are encouraging people to promise, they are promising jobs here and there. But again, I think the might of responsibility between governments, both North and South, is much bigger. It cannot be business as usual when we have just this year, I mean, last year, uh, no, no, 2014, we are told that more than 5,000 people died or disappeared. They are unknown because of this. These are human lives. And as I, I believe, if no more robust uh, act, uh, action is taken, these numbers will increase. In 2015, we'll have even bigger numbers. I think this is unacceptable. I'm talking of government, but I'm talking also of, you know, human lives are not uh, a commodity. To trade. And of course, sometimes it's migration as such, and of course it's trafficking which is involved in this. The channels, and even those who are the barons of smuggling, in many cases they are known. In many cases they are known. I think we should demand that this smuggling in the proportions which are happening because they are reducing human lives to a commodity of trade and pay and, 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 and sell, it is unacceptable in this proportion. So I think it's important that drastic measures are taken against this. Then I wanted also to mention an issue which I believe it's uh, important to, 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 to repeat, although it's almost obvious. I think the way migrants are treated in countries where what we can call the receiving, I'm told that at least 50 million irregular migrants in the world are registered. 50 million people. When I say it is known, it's the conditions in which those, and now I'm speaking as a woman and I'm speaking as a mother, or grandmother actually, children, women. While we are professioning institutions, part of it I think it's important to one, to improve seriously the conditions in which we receive migrants, wherever they come from. And I'm saying this because even in my small country, Mozambique, we do receive migrants. We have them coming from Bangladesh, coming from, you name it. Maybe they are just in transit, but the conditions in which, whether they are in transit, whether it's country, it's a receiving country, the conditions in which migrants are being treated is really unacceptable. And I think we need to make much more effort. Governments have to make much more effort. I think also we need to train 
much better. Migrant officers who are involved, whether it's police in borders, this is a reality which is not going to go away. Migration is part of our life. As we think of best and better systems for education, for health, we also need to think of best, best institutions and proceeding in migration because it's not going to go away. It is part of us. I think we need to increase this this thing which we always talk about as uh, governance, Absolutely. governance in both sides, involving much more people to understand and to participate. These are not issues which are related to government alone. Communities have to be much more uh, made aware of the risks you are a young woman. You are a woman. You are a young person. You don't go, you don't risk your life without having the certainty of in which conditions you go. But how much do we take the time to explain to our own people within communities, engaging community leaders, to explain the risks of moving without the certainty of where you go, how you go, What's going to happen to the other side? So when I talk of governance, yeah, I think also it's uh, education of people to take risk, but it's taking a risk of which they are completely conscious of. I think we need to open up to take the reality that the kind of economies we have and the way they marginalize young people, particularly young people, educated young people, it is not only a question of employment, it's a question of work. So we need to think the way we combine creating jobs, but also creating conditions for young people to self-employ themselves. Otherwise, the numbers of young people who will move will take these risks, it's not going to, to, de, to, to, to reduce. So when I bring, bring the issue of uh, governance, it's not only in receiving countries, but in countries of origin. It's countries where the source of the problem comes from, in which we need to be much more robust in creating opportunities for every single person where we live, so that every citizen will be comfortable to live and thrive. And then the numbers and the quality of migration will be different, and the quality of migration in numbers will be much, 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 much in our control than it does seem to be. It's easy for someone like me to say what I'm saying because I don't have national responsibilities. But at the same time, it is also a concern which is our daily lives. As I said, I'm a grandmother, I'm a mother, and I'm an African woman. Any time we see those things, it's our dignity which is diminished. And because of that, we also take responsibility, but not only to take responsibility, we have want to be part of the solution and not to be seen as only part of the problem, but part of the solution. I know that with the expertise which is gathered in this room, we'll be able to think better, to question what we have not only to do better, but to do more. And within the next post-15 agenda, which we all are going to sign up as government, but I hope we'll sign up also as research institutions, as business community, as civil society organizations, we'll sign up to have an agenda 
which is going to make us much more humane, which is going to make us really responsible, responsible for becoming my brother's keeper and leave no one behind. I thank you. Maybe I need a pen <laughs> if, if they...